Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, I'm going to show you the principle of maximum entropy. As we'll see, it's a totally natural procedure for determining distributions which match the information you bring to the table without accidentally injecting any extra assumptions, which is philosophically the best thing to do. One big punchline is that a lot of the famous distributions you've seen are the result of providing different types of super simple information to this procedure. If I do my job, you should feel the procedure is totally justified, and therefore, those distributions really are the best answers in certain circumstances. To begin, let's start with a simple game. Let's say x is a random variable, which can take the value of 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. Let's also say it's going to spit out a huge stream of n samples. Now, your goal is to guess the proportion of this stream that is each of these digits. So, what percent are zeros or fives or threes? Given just this information, which is virtually nothing, what would you guess? Now, I bet your intuition is guess an equal probability across all digits. They should each have a probability of 10%. And that's correct. But why? One perspective is to consider all possible streams of digits and consider each of their digit distributions. From this perspective, the natural thing to do is to pick whatever distribution arises most frequently in this list. What you discover is there are vastly more streams with a nearly even distribution than uneven. Therefore, pick the equally balanced distribution. That provides a rough intuition, but let's quantify this idea. Let's define a function c, which will count the number of streams which have a given count of digits. In other words, it counts up identical rows from this table. Got it? Clearly, this thing will tell us which distributions are more or less frequent. Now, here's the interesting part. This function is well approximated by a simple expression involving the distribution's entropy. I'll explain this expression in a second, but first, Let's talk about entropy on its own. The entropy of a discrete random variable is a measure of its uncertainty. It's a function of the variable's probabilities given with this expression. Soak it in. It's important. People put it on their gravestones. To get a handle on it, I'm going to show how it behaves. But before I do so, I should mention, the entropy formula is extremely well motivated for reasons well beyond this video. So if you're already familiar with entropy, please excuse me if this description seems incomplete. With that, let's get into it. First, it only depends on the variable's probabilities, not its values. Compare that with something like the variance of a distribution, which totally depends on the values. Therefore, we could represent those probabilities as a bar graph and say entropy is just a measure of this bar graph. Now, let's see how it behaves. If the bar graph becomes more uniform, then it's more uncertain and the entropy increases. In fact, the entropy is maximized at the uniform distribution, if the bar graph becomes more concentrated, then the entropy falls. There's a lot more to it, but that's the primary behavior. With that, let's revisit this expression. What it says is, if you want to know approximately how many streams have digits with some given counts, then turn those counts into probabilities and calculate their entropy. Then the number of streams with those counts will be approximately e to n times that entropy. And if you're curious about the algebra, well, then you're weird, but I'll indulge you and you can pause the video on this annotation. But otherwise, let's notice a few things. First, that this is super convenient and simple and a bit unexpected. And second, if you're selecting the distribution which maximizes entropy, you're picking the distribution which shows up most frequently out of all possible streams. In fact, it tells us more than that. Since the function is exponential, a small change in entropy makes for a giant difference. So, as the length of the stream gets large, a larger and larger proportion of streams have nearly maximal entropy. So this quantifies our choice. If you don't know anything about a distribution, you should guess that which maximizes entropy, which means equal probabilities, because of all possible streams, a huge majority of them have maximal entropy. With that, we are ready to add information. This information is things we get to assume to be true. It's an opportunity for us to insert our assumptions, whatever they may be. The question is, how do they get mixed in? Well, we do that with the principle of maximum entropy. To start, we need to determine how we express our information. It turns out that most of the time, you can express it as an equation, where you select a function and a number, and you declare that the expected value of that function is that number. To state it mathematically, if you know m facts about a distribution, then express them as expectations of m functions equaling some values. We'll call each function gm and the value of their expectation cm. This may sound a bit abstract, but for now, just trust you can encode a lot of information this way. We'll see examples later. 
So let's say you arrive with your information, meaning you've decided a bunch of CMs and GMs. One important thing to realize is that of all possible distributions, only some, if any, satisfy these equations. So it restricts your choice of distribution. Now we can state the principle. Of all distributions that satisfy your equations, pick that which maximizes entropy. And you should do so for the exact same reasons we saw earlier. But how do we actually find this distribution? Well, fortunately, some extremely intelligent people figured out an absolutely life-saving fact. Are you ready? Make sure you're sitting down and swallow anything that you might be eating or drinking. Okay, they gave us a theorem that tells us how to find the constrained maximum entropy distribution. If you have your M facts ready, then the max entropy distribution is given with this expression, where the lambdas are chosen to meet your equations and Z is a normalizer determined by those lambdas to ensure the distribution sums to one. So this means the moment you solve for the lambdas that match your information, you know that is the maximum entropy distribution. Also, notice the constant E just showed up again. What? How did that happen? The math gods work in mysterious ways. Now you may ask, how do you actually solve for these lambdas? Well, in the general case, it can be involved, but you could use numerical methods, or in some cases, an optimization method called karush Khan tucker But as we'll see, you may never need to whip out this machinery. For now though, let's explain this idea visually with our previous digits example. As mentioned, when we only know that the possible values are the digits between zero and nine, then the best guess is the maximum entropy distribution, which is the uniform. Hopefully that's uncontroversial. But now let's say we know that the average of all digits is 6.2. That means we have this equation. Our G function is the identity and our C is 6.2. Now clearly the uniform distribution doesn't have this average, but some distributions do. In fact, there's a whole range of distributions which have a 6.2 average. Now the principle tells us of all of these, pick that which maximizes entropy. That turns out to be this distribution. Satisfying, right? And how did I get it? Well, I used that sweet theorem. That is, I solved for lambda according to this equation. The moment I found a lambda that gives a 6.2 average, I know that's the maximum entropy distribution. Cool, right? Okay, let's step it up a bit. What if in addition to a 6.2 average, I knew the average squared value is 41? Well then, we'd get this distribution. And how did I get it? Just another application of the theorem. My information means my G functions were the identity and the square function. So that implies maximum entropy takes this form. All I need to do is find the lambdas that match my equations. So now you should have a sense of the maximum entropy principle, though we haven't arrived at any famous distributions. To do that, we need to consider the continuous case. The first thing to recognize is that the counting argument I used earlier no longer applies. You can't justify the uniform as the most typical stream of all possible streams, particularly because a continuous domain can be infinitely divided. But nonetheless, let's blindly charge forward and apply the exact same idea by changing sums to integrals. Clearly, we live on the edge. In this case, our entropy changes to something called the differential entropy, and we can rewrite our constraints in a similar fashion. Now conveniently, the distribution which satisfies our constraints and maximizes differential entropy takes the same form we saw earlier. That is, we get this super similar result. And in this case especially, you most likely won't need to solve for these lambdas. That work is done for you. This is where things get interesting. What I'm about to do is show you different choices for your domain over the real line, some constraints you may impose, and the maximum entropy distribution that falls out. To start, the first one should be fairly obvious. If you restrict yourself to be between two numbers A and B, and you impose no constraints, then the maximum entropy distribution is the uniform. No surprise there. Okay, let's say the domain is between zero and infinity, and we know the average is some value. Well, the max entropy distribution that achieves that is the oh so familiar exponential distribution. That's pretty awesome. Super simple constraints leads to a super famous theorem. I love that. Let's push it. Let's say the domain is the entire real line and you know the average is some value. And also the average squared difference from that average is some other value. Well, you guessed it. In that case, you get the normal, another famous distribution. Fortunately, it doesn't stop here. Let's say your domain was the real line above some positive value A. Also, let's say you knew the average log ratio of your variable to that number. Well, that would give you the Pareto distribution. Okay, this may seem like an odd choice, but it's not that weird. 
Anytime you come across something where the smallest value is very common and other values are frequently many multiples of that small value, then the Pareto distribution is a good candidate. Moving on, let's do something similar to the normal distribution. Let's say the domain is the whole real line again and we know the average. But this time, we know the average absolute difference from that average. Then what? Well, in that case, we get the Laplace, another famous distribution. One more. Let's say we knew the average log value and its average square difference. Well, I bet you could guess this one. It's the log normal. Impressed yet? If not, let me tell you, I've left out a bunch. The gamma, the beta, the Cauchy, the Weeble, and others. They are all indebted to this idea. Or are they? We still need to inspect our shaky continuous foundation. In fact, we're going to witness some technical difficulties. Let's first talk about the discrete case. One nice thing about it is, it's totally uncontroversial what the most uninformative distribution is. It's the uniform. One motivation is it enjoys a nice invariance. That is, if you mapped each unique value x can take to some other value, and you carried out the procedure with these new values, it wouldn't change your max entropy distribution. For example, in our digits example, if we were using 10 letters instead of 10 digits, we would get the same answer. We'd have to update our constraints, but that's no problem. Now let's consider the continuous case. As we'll see, the uniform distribution is not necessarily the best choice. And the reason for this is the invariance is lost. If you map x to some f of x, you may get a different max entropy distribution. The reason is because in the discrete case, the entropy does not depend on the values of x. It only cares about their probabilities. In the continuous case, the entropy does depend on the values of x. This is because it's an integral and you have that annoying dx term. And it turns out this is a bit of a problem. Consider the following example. Let's say instead of seeing a stream of digits, you witnessed a stream of squares with varying sizes. And I'll tell you that the largest possible square has a side length of 10 and an area of 100. Now, without any information, what distribution should you apply to these squares? Well, one simple idea is to say their side length is uniformly distributed. Sounds reasonable, right? Not exactly. If you have a uniform distribution over side lengths, you don't have a uniform distribution over their areas. By saying the side length is uniform, you're saying that smaller areas are more likely than larger areas. And who's to say specifying squares in terms of their side lengths is best? So when using a uniform distribution over areas would be just as reasonable as you, yet get a different answer. So it seems being maximally uninformed about these squares is harder. Now, there are clever ways around this issue in other contexts. In particular, the Jeffries prior and Bayesian statistics comes to mind, but I'm not covering that here. Instead, let's focus on what this means for the continuous procedure. In effect, it means we are smuggling in an assumption which fills the gap. That is, we, for no great reason, assume that the uniform distribution over whatever x represents is the most uninformative state. And if you want to learn more, check my sources in the description. There, you'll find a ton of stuff. And finally, thank you for your focus. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Content like this is content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.